You're listening to the Radius Church Podcast, recorded live each Sunday in North Hollywood, California. That was an MRI scan of someone trying not to offend someone else in 2020. (laughs) This might be a crazy idea, but today we are launching a five-week growth series about politics. I know, you might think we're nuts. We're calling it State of Disunion. That might be how you would describe the state of affairs in our nation right now, or at least every single election year. Now, if you're seeing this in high def, you might notice there is an abrasion on my face and wonder what that is. Well, I am what you would call a method preacher. So what I've done is I've injured myself to illustrate what our nation goes through every single election cycle. No, uh, I actually had just a little accident doing some home repair at home, so I'm just really kind of a dummy, but I'm doing fine. Thank you so much for your concern. Uh, Since it's an election year, why don't we start off this talk with a little bit of a vote, and you're going to vote with your emojis. So get your emojis ready for the comments below or in the chat thread, depending on what portal you're watching us through. If you are someone who absolutely loves the political climate right now, I want you to vote with a heart emoji. Go ahead. There's probably a bit of digital silence right now. If you're somebody who is often frustrated or even saddened by the political climate, then I want you to vote with a frowny face emoji. We might see a little more activity with that one. Uh, If you're somebody, and you can vote more than once, if you're somebody who is uh, a bit uncertain, uh, maybe concerned, maybe you would even say scared, say scared about the future of America, I want you to vote with a screechy face emoji, that screechy teeth one, you know that I'm talking about? Like, yeah. You know, in my voting life, which hasn't been, you know, as long as maybe some of you who are watching today, but uh, my voting life, I've not seen a a president as polarizing as the one that's been president for the last four years. And I'm not making a political statement here, just an observation that even though if you look at the history of America, there have been far more polarizing presidents before. But man, uh, even his name alone elicits a big emotional charge. I found myself avoiding even saying the word Trump as a verb in the last four years because I didn't want to boil up any political waters at all. Uh, And then on top of that, we have a very complicated, it's always a complicated election year, but this one seems a little more complicated because of the COVID-19 crisis. We thought that this November was going to be all about immigration or healthcare or the economy. And now who knows what it's going to be about, right? One more vote for us. If you think, and it's okay to think this, if you think that preachers and religion and churches have no business talking about politics, we need to leave well enough alone, then I want you to vote with just a hand, put a hand emoji. Don't worry, we're not gonna kick you off the thread. You have every reason to have that opinion for sure. Often the voice of religion has been a further voice of division, and this is already a season of great division in our nation. In fact, researchers have been tracking congressional votes for years. Since 1949 is is where this graphic comes from. Uh, And what they've done is, or what this graphic represents rather, is times where, uh, you know, parties have voted for different legislation. And every time you see gray, it's when both sides of the aisle have collaborated around a bill or some piece of legislation. And as you've seen over the years, and particularly the landscape that we're in now, uh, we see less and less gray and we see more of a binary climate in congressional voting. And what these researchers are calling this climate is hyper-partisanship, or in the words of this series, disunion. And what it means ultimately is that it's a slower working government. It it means that there's more whiplash every four years as things seem to flip-flop back and forth. And what it might lead us to think is that the middle is disappearing, that really you have to be on one side or the other. I actually don't think the middle is disappearing. I just think the middle is losing its voice. 
I, I don't think there's two categories of people. I don't think people fit neatly into just two categories. I just think that we are angry and scared. And when we're angry and scared, in order for us to have a whimper of our voice heard, we feel tempted to find the closest crowd. So even if we haven't thought through, if we totally align with everything that that crowd represents, we're angry and we're scared, and that magnetizes us to the nearest mob. Now, on top of that, right now we live in a time when there is so much pressure to say something. Right? It used to be, I think, therefore I am, and now it's, I tweet, and therefore I am. Uh, in fact, that's what is called an influencer now. So if you want influence, I suppose you have to make sure you even prematurely state your opinion. I don't know where you get your news, but you've seen evidence of this. I watch several news sources throughout the week, and I notice that oftentimes what makes the headlines is not news at all. It's actually people's reactions to news, right? People are outraged over, or the Twitterverse is exploding over, or, you know, Timmy TomTom Tom, 1987 said, that's not news. <laughs> That's clickbait, right? So listen, as we start this series and as I start this interaction today, I wanna to issue a challenge for all of us. Between now and November 8th, I challenge you to put something more powerful before your politics. If you consider yourself a person of faith, I challenge you to put your faith before your politics. Put your faith filter first and your political filter somewhere way downstream from that. Now, what I'm not saying is that your faith is going to squarely land you on one side or the other. In fact, there's people listening today who would say, my faith justifies the fact that I'm a Democrat. My faith justifies the fact that I'm a Republican. Jesus followers, Christians would say, it's because I am a Christian that I vote largely Democratic or Independent or Libertarian or even Republican. And you would probably have a great rationale theologically. You would use scripture to justify your position. So that's not what I'm saying. I'm not gonna tell you how to vote during this series, but I wanna do something more productive for us. I wanna give us the tools we need to navigate the hostility that we're going to encounter this election year and emerge on the other side of it more unified. And this is important to all of us, having our voices heard even more clearly so that we can start to see the change that we wanna see in the world. But in order to do that, we're gonna to have to approach our politics the way that Jesus approached everything. The way Jesus approached everything when he came across every single person in every single conversation he had. And you won't even have to write this down. This is gonna be so simple. This is how Jesus approached everything. Put people first, right, and your politics second. Put people first and your opinions second. Put people first. That's how Jesus approached everything. In fact, what you often see is Jesus hated moments when people would use positions to damage people. People would use their politics to hurt people. Uh, spiritual and political pundits at the time uh, couldn't stand Jesus. Uh, he got in their way. His influence as it was growing was a threat to their influence and prominence in their voice. At least they thought it was. And so they would always be on guard or, or rather they would always be watching to see if Jesus was going to make a false move, if he would say something stupid and maybe he would lose his ratings. Uh, in the beginning of Matthew's biography of Jesus, uh, in the, uh, rather, in the beginning of, of Matthew 22 in Matthew's biography of Jesus, these political and religious pundits used two controversial topics to see if they could catch Jesus saying something just a little bit off, something that they could use to, to damage his public opinion. And just to give you further evidence that people haven't changed much, those two things that they used to get Jesus off his game were taxes and death. <laughs> uh, Jesus as he was responding to these questions, was not answering in a way that made everybody happy. Instead, he just kept answering in a way that made everybody think, and it shut it down. So they, they, they went further, and in Matthew 22, verse 34, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, as the first ones who brought up this political discourse, the Pharisees, other religious and political pundits, they got together, and one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law. Now we got him. This is gonna be a battle of pedigree. Jesus is not competent to have the influence that a lot of people are giving him right now. He's gonna look like an idiot. We're gonna look smart, power restored. There are over 600 commands in the Torah. How could you possibly choose what was the greatest commandment of all? So tell me, 
Jesus, what do you think God wants us to do more than anything else? Jesus answered in verse 37, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Okay, well, that was expected. This is what they call the Shema. This was Deuteronomy 6, 5. Good Jewish adherents would recite this. Many still recite this twice a day. Uh, so that, that was an easy one. That's a give me. But then in the very next breath, Jesus says in verse 39, and the second is like it. In the original language, he's saying the second is equivalent. The second is just as important. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, well Jesus, I didn't ask for two. No, no, no. Listen. You cannot have one without the other. Now, nothing was new about these commands. They were both in Torah. But Jesus, what he does that seems so remarkable is fuses those two ideas together to create, listen, one unified rule of life. He says the way that you demonstrate on the outside that you really do love God on the inside is in the way you treat people. And this makes so much sense. Think about it. If, if there is a God and you try to mistreat he, she, it, they, it does not threaten God at all. What could you possibly do to harm God? But you do have the power to harm people. You do have the power to malign people. You do have the power to silence people. You do have the power to fire people. You do have the power to drive people out of your family. And when you damage the thing that God loves most, you are proving that you do not love God with everything that you are. Listen, listen, what every candidate is going to say this November, they'd be foolish not to, is that in some fashion they love God or they follow God or they have a strong faith. But what we've experienced, not just in these last four years, but throughout the political history of our nation, is there is a whole lot of wiggle room in what that means for people, right? In fact, just to state it dramatically, there are people who actually take God very, very seriously and use that as a justification to harm people. We call them extremists. Jesus says that if you're going to love God the way you show on the outside, that you love him on the inside is by how you treat people. And then he wraps up this response with something that is so helpful. It is so productive for our election year. And yet, if I'm honest, it is so convicting for me. He says in verse 40, all the law, all the prophets hang on these two commandments. If you remember nothing else, if you could distill all the various rules that govern life and how you treat people into one guiding principle, it would be simple. Not easy, but simple. Love. If you really want to know the identifying mark of somebody who loves God with everything that they are, it would be love. In other words, if you forget everything else, and you don't know what to do as you're wading through the political conversations and maybe even doctrinal divisions as some of you people of faith are trying to wrestle with that in this season. If you don't know where you stand or on which platform or how you're supposed to respond in debates, you still are empowered to treat people in love. We can do this. Now, I want you to imagine with me, and this is an incredible fantasy world, but man, how powerful it would be. What would happen if our world, in our world rather, if between now and November 8th, every single person put this into practice. Just imagine with me what the world would be like if between now and November 8th, every single person put this into practice. I know this is a fairy tale, but imagine if our social media feeds, right, and our televised debates, and if we're allowed to do them, our picket lines and our national conventions were peppered with people who were more focused on treating people the way that they hoped to be treated than anything else. I'll tell you what would happen. It almost wouldn't matter who got elected if people decided to make this the driving rule of life. You want to know why? Because every single time, in every single generation, in every single election year, your behavior carries more weight in this world than your opinion. The fact is, and this is the mindset that frames the whole series that we're about to embark on, those who love, listen to me, will always have more influence than those who win. Those who love will always have a greater impact in this world than those who win. But, but Joseph, I thought I had to win this argument in order to see the change in the world I wanted to see. Not necessarily. 
I, I thought my candidate had to win the election in order to make progress in the world the way that I want to see it. Not necessarily. What history has told us time and time again is that those who will choose to love will always leave a greater impact on the world than those who win. Now, before you get too excited, because we all love that idea, at least generically, you have to know what Jesus meant when he said, love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. Because when Jesus said the word love, he meant something very specific. He didn't mean be polite. He didn't mean just simply be civil. He certainly didn't mean keep your mouth shut. What Jesus meant and what he embodied with his example when he said to love people as much as you love yourself means that you have an unconditional commitment to the highest good for an imperfect people. Love, the way Jesus defined it, was an unconditional commitment to the highest good for an imperfect people. So this begins for all of us by putting the person first and our positions far behind that. The person first and our opinions and our perspectives trailing that quite a bit. Now, now just because we love to be practical, I'll give you one takeaway just to start. It means, uh, as we are entering into political conversations this year, it means that I am willing to admit at first that everybody's behavior and everybody's perspective makes perfect sense to them. What we have to realize is that most everybody thinks that they are the good guy in their narrative, that they're doing the very best thing, that they're doing the right thing. So if you find yourself saying, which I found myself saying before, I cannot understand how anybody could believe differently than me. I can't understand how anybody could vote differently than me. We have to pause and humbly admit that it may, there may not be our reason for it, but it doesn't mean there's not a good reason. You just might not know it yet. It calls us into a greater curiosity and compassion for the people we're talking to. And one of the greatest things that we get from this is that it's going to fight against what psychology calls the false consensus bias. Uh, and this is something you're going to see threaded throughout this series because I think it's actually one of the greatest pandemics that we're facing as a nation. This binary thinking, this false consensus bias, it's this delusion that there is some other side based on just one or two criteria. And we see this all the time, right? You see this, it's like, uh, who watches NCIS? Well, it's probably the same person who also drives blank and the same person who also likes to eat at blank. The same person who loves to vote for blank. Uh, these are the same people who. And they are not like me, so they must be backwards and they must be stupid. It's just another way that you and I subconsciously reject the possibility that people who don't feel the same way we do might actually sometimes be right. So, as any debate club veteran will tell you, if you cannot make your opponent's point for them, then you have yet to truly grasp the issue. So it's a way of putting the person before the perspective. When the perspective comes first, we often do not have the patience or curiosity to see the person behind that perspective. This is part of what it would mean to love your neighbor as much as you hope they love you, as much as you love yourself. Now, I'm sure a lot of us probably think this is a good idea, Maybe you'll try it out, but I want to be direct for those of you who are followers of Jesus. This is a non-negotiable for us. This is a responsibility for us. Does, does it mean we, we can't have our own opinions, that we can't speak up? Of course not. I, I hope that over the course of this series and throughout this election year, you actually form even greater conviction around some of your political values and ideals. Paul, a Jesus follower, he actually wrote one time in 1 Corinthians 16, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. I think he could add be vocal in the right way at the right time. But I think what's tempting for us to think is that the intensity of our tone is actually the best way to demonstrate the sincerity of our convictions, when often the opposite is true. Paul frames the entire thing the way I think Jesus would frame the entire thing, be who you are, be strong in your convictions, be courageous, be strong. And then he ends that whole teaching by saying, do everything in love. Do everything motivated by an unconditional commitment for the highest good for an imperfect people. Imagine if between now and November 8th, our entire nation decided to do that. And I know that that's a fantasy, of course, but imagine if between now and November 8th, just a few more people in our nation decided to employ that value in their lives. 
my wife and my oldest daughter, they were supposed to be in Boston a couple of months ago, but of course, plans changed in light of the crisis. Cannot wait to go there again. We love Boston. Uh, and I'll never forget about four years ago, just my wife and I, Katie and I were in Boston and we did the touristy thing. We paid for that duck boat tour. Uh, and if you've been there, you've taken the duck boat tour, then you know how incredible it is. Uh, in fact, I would recommend anybody do that. I know local Bostonians who would recommend taking the duck boat tour and we got the best tour guide as we were going around this historic city. He was actually a high school history teacher and he shared something during our tour that he tells all of his students. And it was so great, I recorded it on my phone and then I wrote it down later. He said, democracy is an experiment that's still being tested. And one of the greatest parts of it is how you lose. The founding fathers would go into halls and debate like mad, but when the voice of the people spoke, when someone was elected, the idea behind it was that the country would then rally behind that candidate as one. You and I, he said, are still part of this ongoing experiment. The greatest opportunity that you have this election year, please vote yes, but the greatest opportunity you have for influence, I promise you, is how you treat people who do not agree with you. When Jesus said to love God with everything that you are and the way you show on the outside that you love him, on the inside is to love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. Someone followed up with Jesus in a different conversation and said, well, who's my neighbor? And then he told a story basically illustrating anybody that you come in contact with is your neighbor. Anybody that you come in contact with is an opportunity to love someone as much as you love yourself. Love is what sets the tone of everything that we're gonna cover over the next four weeks. Um, it is going to be simple, but it's going to be difficult. And if we do our jobs right, everybody will be uncomfortable at certain points. But everyone I think is going to take away something that empowers us to have a much more productive, unifying and influential election year than ever before. And here's the reason. Those who love will always have more influence than those who win. Now, because I want you to invite a friend, I want you to join us over the next few weeks. Uh, let me give you a little heads up, a preview of what we're gonna be covering. Uh, because those who love have more influence than those who win, we're going to talk about when love demands that you stick up or stand against power. Uh, because love is the most influential, we're going to talk about when love tells you how to vote and how to incorporate your values as you are a voting, as you have the privilege of voting in this nation. Uh, we're going to be talking about where to put your concerns and your fears and your uncertainty in a place that is most productive. Uh, and finally, we're going to take the pressure off of November 8th by talking about what every election actually means to our day-to-day -day lives. What, what impact does it actually have? How can we prepare for that now so that we're experiencing the best we can, no matter who's elected, no matter who's going to be standing in the Oval Office on November 9th? Let me just wrap up by saying something we've all heard before. People will tell you that actions speak louder than words. And I find that that's true, but I actually want to take it one step further. Actions are what create an opportunity to speak the most important things. This is true for everybody. But again, if you are a Christian, you are called to influence above all else. You are the light of the world so that people have a chance through your life to see the world as it could be with all of its mercy and all of its justice and all of its love. So why would you burn a bridge now? Because in a few months, the election will be over and there will be an other side who will inevitably need comfort or they'll need direction or they'll need a friend. And who will they turn to? Will it be you? In another letter, Paul wrote, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy, which means different, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves, this is the first impression people should have of you, with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other, stick with each other, and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, if you have a hard time remembering all of them, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. 
My friends, this is not a formula to political success. The person who loves most may not be the person who wins, but this is a formula for the most significant influence we can have in other people's lives. And that is what we want more than anything. Let me pray for us and for our nation right now as we start this series. God who is ultimately in charge, cause our minds to remember that and our hearts to remember that whenever we face moments of uncertainty and fear. God, because you have commanded us, I pray for wisdom for those who are in political leadership. So much hangs in the balance. What an incredible burden they have to make decisions to impact people's lives. God, I pray they have wisdom and I pray that they have a humility that looks like Jesus. That they would be willing to lay aside their ego, their pride, and their fear to make decisions that serve people best. And God, I pray for me and for anybody who wants to agree with me. We are praying, God, that our, our first impression, our leading virtue would be love. Not because it's a comfortable idea. Often, it's the most uncomfortable choice to make. But God, cause us to love because love is the greatest power of influence that we have available to us. We want to see the world changed. And the way you want to do that through us is by the way we love our neighbor, especially those who do not think, believe, or vote like us. May we see them the way you see them and put those people first before our politics. Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you for listening. For more information, follow us on social media at Radius Church LA and visit us on the web at radius.la.